Have you ever considered sourcing Amazon products from Europe? It could be even beneficial if you are selling your products on European marketplaces. In that case, you could optimize your supply chain and avoid uh, some unnecessary delays and maybe cost if you are sourcing products from China. In this video, sourcing expert Yulia Blinova from Zignify will share with us some tips how you can find uh, factories in Europe which could manufacture your Amazon products and what kind of benefits and challenges you could face in this process. Hi Yulia, it's always a pleasure to have you on Orange Click YouTube channel to talk about all things related to sourcing. Uh, today we will focus on uh, one specific concept uh, sellers could use to improve their supply chain. But as always, before we start uh, with the discussion, could you first introduce yourself and also let us know how Signify helps uh, Amazon sellers? Hi, Lizette. Hope everything's okay with you. Uh, yeah, so what I do is I do product sourcing supply chain and everything that relates to that. For the last 18 years, I've done it for myself, for our own brands, uh, of which we have two, and we're doing it for tons of Amazon sellers, e-commerce, and we're actually doing sourcing for Amazon itself. So we help people find manufacturers across the globe and, you know, make sure that everything is tip top or top notch or whatever other <laughs> expression there is. Yeah. So that's okay. kind of in a nutshell. Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah, you can, uh, uh, people who are watching us uh, who maybe don't know you yet or don't know Signify, uh, you're always attending different Amazon events as well. So it's uh, very nice that people are able to uh, see you in person and talk again, all things about sourcing and also ask different questions. Uh, so today we will focus a little bit more on uh, nearshoring, a concept we will um, introduce to sellers. But before we actually go into it, I wanted to ask, uh, are there any news, anything special you would like to share with our audience regarding like sourcing and how things are overall going for Amazon sellers, let's say within the past half a year or a year, because uh, you are working with a lot of sellers, you are attending a lot of events. So probably, you know, all the most important information. Some sellers are selling and going away, uh, but mainly the reason for them is because this is not their main uh business right they might have some other jobs or some other businesses and they don't give enough focus to amazon most of the other sellers that i've seen who have started in the last few years or who have been selling for 10 years they're still staying they're still staying strong um we're all struggling with uh of course the ppc the the costs right but i mean this is normal um yeah in general what we have been seeing is that people are trying to bring more and more products onto the market they try to diversify they try to build brands so before you could see a lot of ah, oh, here is a not a speaker sorry a headphones i will slap any logo on it and kind of go i don't really care about i do care about the quality so i can get a five-star review but i don't care about the improvements um currently what we're seeing is the opposite at least with our customers because we have tons of people who are coming with us with their own tech packs the, the tech packs that are ready whereas two years ago i'm talking to the customers and like do you have a tech pack a what now they come with those they're ready this is i mean this is this is an incredible change so we see people who've been selling and who've been doing okay and kind of understand the industry they are not going anywhere they're developing um a lot of uh, people from europe are starting to move towards the united states of america right so because if you talk, uh, I mean, we have a lot of German customers and European in general. Uh, if you take customers in Estonia, right, most of those guys, they directly sell in U.S. They're not going to sell in Germany. If you take the Germans, they sell in Germany. And for them, going to U.S. is like, oh, Lord, how can I ever do this? Right. It, it, it's it's absolutely different world. So we've been seeing a lot of this, a lot of encouragement from the community and people actually doing this. We ourselves as sellers, uh, we sell in Germany and now we're moving towards the U.S. market as well because it's time. Right. So um, for those who are starting to sell, I'd say good on you. Uh, you lose a lot of sleep you're gonna have a lot of troubles and uh you will cry yourself to sleep but uh for most of us you kind of get over it and you come out uh you come out good and uh with, with good position on the other side yeah 
Okay, nice, Orbi. And uh, yeah, it's funny that you highlighted this difference between Estonians and uh, Germans, because this is something I always tell other sellers I meet as well, that I'm personally from Estonia, and I know that most sellers here, we always start with US market first, and then kind of expand over time to the EU markets. But I know in Germany, it's the opposite way. So yeah, it's super interesting how um, things can be very different based on the country where you're from, and, and how just generally people are used to doing things. So um, yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's move on to sourcing then. So near shoring, uh, for me, it was kind of a new term. I think I haven't used this term uh, personally myself before. So uh, could you explain first a little bit uh, what it is and what do you mean by it? I'm not sure if there is a definition of it in the Webster dictionary or something <laughs> like this, but you know, honestly, I don't care. Um, yeah, basically, uh, near shoring can be used for many different things. In our situation, we're talking specifically about product sourcing, and that means produce your product as close as possible to the country where you are actually going to sell. So for example, if you do sell in Germany, producing in Poland versus producing in China will be near shoring, right? If you will switch from manufacturing in China to manufacturing in Poland. So this term uh, is being used a lot right now by huge multinational corporations. Uh, I literally read an article yesterday uh, about Coca-Cola and they invested 170 a million dollars specifically on supply chain optimization, near shoring, packaging, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, only 170 million? That's not a lot for Coca Cola. Um, Intel, uh, for example, uh, also is looking into near shoring. So, yeah, we want to produce as close as possible to, the, to our market for several reasons, right? Uh, one of the first reasons is. First, it's near. You can go there, right? You can go, you can check. That means you have more safety, you have more security, you have more control over what is happening. Um, secondly, your turnaround time is a lot faster. Let's say you're ordering a product from China. It takes 30 days to produce. It takes 40 days to deliver. You're at 70 days, right? And that means in those 70 days, your funds are stuck. Then it still needs to get into Amazon warehouse, gets checked in. So add another 20 days or something like this, or you 90 days, three months. So your financials are stuck for three months and you can't get kind of anything out and use that money. Whereas if you're selling, let's say, again, in US and you decided to switch your manufacturing from China to Mexico, uh, let's say they will take the same same 30 days to produce. It will only take five to 10 days to deliver, right? So you're kind of uh, cutting your time in half or more than in half. Your finances are running a lot smoother. You have more capital. You have higher turnover. You can use that money for developing this particular product or other businesses. So, and I already mentioned faster delivery times, which is, I mean, if we order some products from Poland, it takes two days to deal. I mean, mm -hmm. come on, two days, right? We order some packaging in Poland. They manufacture it depending on the complexity of the packaging and things like this. Uh, but let's say they can produce within one week and then deliver within two days. Uh, you're under 10 days. I mean, this is insane, nice. right? Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay. And and I know that we have uh, been talking with you in previous interviews also about sourcing from different countries. And I think already for more than one year, maybe already two years, uh, we and, and you especially have been educating sellers about the possibilities of sourcing from Europe, for example, if you are a European-based seller. So um, because you work with sellers and both the manufacturers, do you actually see the increase of sellers starting to source uh, from Europe or it's kind of like a so slow uh, transition to there or or it, has it been like growing thanks to the educational and, and the awareness part of it as well? Definitely has been growing because of the educational uh, part of it because every time I go to some event or I speak at an event or I'm having a call with a potential customer and I'm asking them so like let's say you're you're sourcing I don't know, clothing right uh, or something like this, and they're doing it in China. They're selling in US. They're paying, or, or they're selling in Germany. Uh, I'm asking why. There is Turkey. There is Pakistan. There are different countries, right? There is even Poland to consider, or Portugal. And they're like, ooh, 
you can manufacture outside of China. Magic. I mean, I seriously like it's it's people don't they really think that you can't produce anywhere anything other than in China. So definitely talking to people, trying to spread the word that it's possible um, is definitely helping. But in general, um, sellers who have been in the business for quite some time, let's say two years plus, three years plus, they understand and they kind of come across this themselves. How? Uh, because they start searching for solutions for their immediate problems, which are higher costs. Uh, lower, uh, you know, very slow delivery times, potential disruptions in the supply chain, right? Um, because we started growing as a company, we started growing like crazy during Corona, because factories in China were closed, and our customers came to us and said, or who are our customers now say, help, what do we do? And we started searching for alternatives. And then they were already winners, because in the first months that Corona happened, the supply chain hasn't collapsed completely, right? Because it kind of came, it started in December, then it kind of came to Europe in March, and then later on. So by that time, all of our guys were set up and they were already manufacturing in Europe and they were pushy. Everything was great. And then the supply chain collapse happened and they were like, oh, help. So um, yes, a lot of people are switching. They come at their own um, initiative. Uh, for a lot of them, we're kind of doing a hybrid supply chain um, supply chain strategy, meaning they're still manufacturing in China, but we're finding alternatives for them. Once this alternative is found, we make sure that it is slowly transitioning from one factory to another. I don't see a point of um, kicking out a good manufacturer if you have good margins still, right? Kicking out your good manufacturer in China with whom you might have built a relationship uh, and switching everything directly to European one. Because you need to work out a good relationship with the new manufacturer as well. And this takes time, right? Uh, I give you an example. For our own products, for our second brand, we manufacture everything in Germany. And you would think that Sebastian, my husband being German, and this guy, the owner of the factory being German, that they would be like, oh, awesome, yeah, great, we can say. No, no, because he's per he, he might be German, the factory owner, but he's human, and humans sometimes are, I don't know how to say this in diplomatic terms, but humans don't always think, right, before they do things. <laughs> Um, so you need to build that relationship. You need to work together. You need to compromise. And this is when I'm doing my speech, one of the things I always, or many different speeches, I always mention that you need to build a relationship like a marriage with your manufacturer, because sometimes you will have to back down. You can't always win because this is a relationship and a partnership. So yeah, tons of people are switching and um, doing the hybrid supply chain. A lot of people in Europe, uh, depending on the product, um, if it's electronics, some people are switching from China to India, to Malaysia, to Vietnam. So we've been doing that. Um, with textiles, it's India, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia. Shoes, Indonesia, Portugal. Um, ceramics, glassware, Portugal. So, you know, even in Estonia, right, you can produce so much. You guys do uh, clothing, you guys do tons of different wooden products, products for sauna. That's my favorite part uh, because I'm a sauna fan. Um, yeah, and people, they still, we reach only so many, right? Our reach is only um, so big. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we you you opened how it's from the sellers and from the seller's perspective, uh, switching over, uh, let's say, from China to Europe. But uh, how do you feel how it's, uh, what's the situation from the manufacturer side? Are our factors, for example, those factories you work together with, are they now over time, let's say the past few years, are they also now more um, experienced in terms of, how to work together with brands who source for Amazon? Is there anything specific they 
kind of didn't know maybe before, but now know, uh, because I think this is also a question that sellers usually have. When they go to a Chinese factory, they already know they probably manufacture for many Amazon sellers and they are well aware of the process and the platform, but how it is with the European uh, manufacturers, for example. This is a complicated part, absolutely. Um, and this is what I always say, when you are trying to find a manufacturer outside of China, and it might even be Thailand, right? It might be, uh, you know, the bordering countries, Thailand doesn't really border with China, but I mean, in the near, um, you need to explain to them, right? If you go to Germans, Polish, et cetera, et cetera, they do have a little bit more knowledge right now because we have more private label companies popping up, uh, especially when it comes to private label cosmetics, uh, supplements, vitamins, more vitamins, an exceeding amount of vitamins, some tea. So, so yes, they are starting to understand the premises of the business. But again, um, this will be, the owners will have a very particular profile. It's very rare that you will see an owner who will be 50 or 55 plus, and he will be understanding, like, you know, all of this. Uh, it's the younger generation. So uh, my age, mid thirties, you know, the children of the 55 year olds, and uh, they are traveling the world. They are in this industry. They've seen what's happening in the US and they're trying to replicate it. Did the pan pandemic and the COVID period also influence it a little bit they, that they were more interested into learning those new opportunities with working with uh, private label brands? Uh, no. <laughs> At least, sorry, at least this is not what we've seen. I mean, look, mm -hmm. these guys are not complete prudes or anything like this. They're in general open to new opportunities. And again, all of this is a personal choice. If you're a horrible human being, you're a horrible human being, no matter how old you are, right? And I've seen some uh, factory owners. I mean, we literally have a situation for one of our German customers. He was manufacturing a product. Uh, or we found the factory for him in Poland. Everything was great. Sample was created. And we were waiting for photos and videos of the samples before the sample would be sent out from Poland to Germany. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, excuses, 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 call it nothing. So we ended up going there to the factory. We, right, we, without even telling the client, we just went there because this is our responsibility. Uh, we go into his furniture salon, whatnot, da, 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 and he's like, oh, hello, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sure, follow me, I will show you the sample. And the weirdest thing happened. So we were, we were walking through the showroom into the back where he has the factory, and halfway through the showroom, he's like, no, I don't want to work with you. You came here, even though before, like two seconds before he said, yeah, let me show you the sample. We're walking and he's like, no, I don't want to work with you. You showed up unannounced. This is not a good way to do business. Okay. Go, go figure what the hell is happening in a person's head. So most likely he never produced the sample. He was making excuses, but why not just say, right? Mm -hmm. And here, if you're thinking about China, for example, or Asia in general, they might be lying about this because traditionally it is very, uh, very horrible for them to lose face in front of you, right? So I'm thinking, are the Polish the same? Is it? Is because I, I've never noticed this in <laughs> Slavic people that we would lose face because, you know, we haven't done something, right? Most of uh -huh. the people are just going to continue blatantly lying or our defense is offense. We start screaming at you and blaming, but you know, it was it's the weirdest thing. So you have great manufacturers and you have not so great manufacturers. Um, and with the pandemic, uh, to be open and honest, they've received a lot more orders um, because as much as factories were closed in China, they were not as much closed in Europe. So, and this was exactly the moment where the manufacturer, uh, where the our customers were transferring their products from China to Europe. So uh, one of the guys came to us during the pandemic and he said, oh, I have a manufacturer in Belgium for some supplements. Uh, the lead time is eight months. <laughs> I'm like, seriously? He's like, yeah, he's booked out, mm -hmm. right? Our manufacturer, we're we're uh, we we're placing an, an an order for our products right now. 
Um, we contacted the manufacturer last week to place an order for three of the products. Um, he's like, I can produce at the end of September after the summer holidays. <laughs> but, but because we've been working with this guy for so long and we try to keep a little bit of a personal relationship, I don't know how he did it, but even with us, without us paying a deposit, he already produced all of the products. Okay. He's already produced, and we're just waiting for uh, like uh, one more sticker, uh, which is being produced right now. Because we were like, okay, we're not in a hurry; we'll order the sticker. He's like, uh, guys, by the way, I've already produced everything. I, I'm, I'm bottling everything. All is good. Uh, where is the sticker? Like, okay. Oh, by the way, send me money. Okay, awesome. But this is basically because you have developed not only this professional uh, relationship, but you have that personal factor in it and, and he trusts you and you probably have been working well together beforehand. So uh, he kind of prioritized, he knew how important it is for you, although they have this vacation, right? So he tried to yeah. uh, put the or manufacturing. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. But, and you know, we, we, we didn't have a, or we don't have a perfect relationship. Sometimes he's a, a very, very bad human being and mm -hmm. we respond as very bad human beings as well. But <laughs> this is normal because um, one thing, and I think this is extremely important for the people, for the sellers to understand, whereas China might have the big Lao Bang, the big boss, right? Mini bosses, uh, mini, mini bosses, sales people, pro uh, tons of people. The Europeans don't have this. I literally know factories for very, uh, who, who do private label for the biggest German brands. And they grew together with those brands. And uh, we were in touch with the owner recently to see with all the factory, right? To see how he's doing, is everything okay? The, 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 you know. And um, I'm like, so if we have inquiries, where should we send them? He's like, to me. I'm like, but you are the big boss. You're the, you're the main guy. <laughs> so after so many years, after growing a factory, after building extra facilities to accommodate all of the production, he still doesn't have like salespeople or anything like this. The same goes for our factory. Our um, our manufacturer, he produces for some big brands as well. But he's like our main point of contact and he's the, he's the owner of the factory. And we've been to the factory. It's a nice facility, et cetera. It's, it's all good, modern and all of those things. And I'm thinking, what the hell? So this is what people don't understand. Um, when it comes to European uh, style management, I'm, I'm not taking US, US is very different, mm -hmm. but specifically in Europe, that we have this thing here that they have, especially if the factory owners are men, they, uh, no offense to any man who is watching, uh, but they have an extremely hard time of letting go and delegating things. And this is where you might run into problems because those guys don't only talk to customers, potential customers, existing customers, but they somehow need to manage the factory as well, the employees and this and that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is something to take into consideration when you're trying to do near shoring and you're switching, for example, from China to Europe specifically, right? Uh, Turkey is very different. India is, is an absolutely different story. Mexico is another one. US is also another. But with the European, this is the main topic that they wear. This one person wears way too many hats. Yeah. Okay. That's that's very good information. I think we haven't uh, uh, talked about it before in our earlier interviews. So I think that's uh, definitely um, eye opening. Uh, but let's uh, go back to your uh, Sona example. So let's say I'm manufacturing something in China right now for Sona, some kind of accessory mm -hmm. maybe. And I would now like to find a manufacturer for, let's say, even for the same type of product, I would just want to move the production to Europe. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no one platform I could go to and search for the product and see all of the Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian Polish, German manufacturer showing up. So uh, what are kind of the first steps? Um, how should I get this process going? Mm -hmm. So um, we need to, there is no one platform. There are globally about 50 different uh, platforms that can be used for different countries. Like uh, if you're in Europe, it might be Europages. If you're in Germany, it might be WLW for German manufacturers. 
But um, we also need to understand that uh, the way that products are manufactured in China are very different from the way the products are manufactured in Europe. Um, because for the Europeans, combining several ma different material types together is extremely complicated. Whereas in China, you can say, I want uh, this cup, it will be made out of China, right? The China, the, the ceramics, et cetera, et cetera. And I want a metal a bowl on top or something like this. This is two different materials combining this. This is developing. This is, you know, this is R&D, research and development, um, which is relatively easy to do in China. In Europe, that's where the thing starts to get complicated. Um, it's, um, I'm not sure how it is in Estonia, for example, but let's say in Germany, I have problems with uh, electricity. I don't know, my lights are flickering or something like this. I can call in a person to try and come and fix my lights. He will look at it and say, okay, I found the problem and your problem is not because of the light, but because of this socket. Okay, fix it. I cannot. I am not qualified to do this. You need to call a guy who is specialized in sockets, right? So then you call another guy and he comes up with a different issue. And then you call a Polish guy uh, and then he goes in and fixes everything. For example, at least this is how it works in Germany. And the factories are extremely similar to that point, right? The factories who produce wooden products, they will produce wooden products and they're extremely likely to develop some new products for you. But again, you will require a tech back. The first thing that I would personally do, or how we do this, right? By now we know where to produce wood. If uh, uh, what is the name of uh, the wooden spool spoon in uh, Estonian? I know in uh, Finland we say when we visit our friend, it's lölu, lölu, like pour water. What's the name in? Uh, uh, in sauna or overall? In sauna. In sauna. Well, we call it. I don't know. Quilp. Maybe I don't know. Estonians, <laughs> Estonians watching us uh, can uh, can let us know uh, because we just use some random thing at our home to pour water. So <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, so the first thing um, you can try to search by specific product and material, right? If you were to go on Alibaba, you would type in wooden spoon for sauna, right? One of the first things that you can do is pretty much the same thing. Go on Google and, I don't know, wooden spoon for sauna manufacturer Europe. Okay, a few things might come up for you, but most likely it will be e-commerce and online stores who are already selling and they will not manufacture. So the first thing you will add, or the second thing you will actually need to do is find out where can be the wooden products produced in Europe in the first place. Right. So can they be produced in Estonia? Yes. Can they be produced in Finland? Yes. Germany? Yes. Poland? Yes. So you literally type in uh, manufacturer wooden products Europe or where are wooden products manufactured in Europe? Right. Or um, top uh, exporting countries for wood in Europe, because if they have enough of that wood, they most likely will be exporting it to other countries for manufacturing something else. Um, so with this, you will start finding the manufacturers who are working in that area. From there, it's literally opening up websites, going through them, seeing if something uh, might resemble what you want and calling them, calling, calling and talking. Because we need to remember that Updating the website is a lot of work. And as we already established, European manufacturers, they have one boss who does everything. So imagine when was the last time they he updated the website. I, I just wanted to say probably the, the main, uh, main boss is also responsible for the website. So probably it's like somewhere down the list. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, you need to do a lot of, but you need to understand like, okay, these guys do wood or you might actually find the spoon, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's a lot of calling, a lot of emails, a lot of getting in touch. Uh, also uh, trying to get in touch if they don't respond to emails, et cetera, et cetera. 
also getting in touch with them over LinkedIn, over Xing, uh, over Instagram, Facebook. So any point of contact that you can find, this will be extremely useful. Um, this is this is where the tedious part comes in. Um, we see a lot of people who come to us and say, you know, I've I'm so tired. I've been doing the research in, in, in Europe for such a long time. I've contacted so many manufacturers and I got nothing. Okay, how many manufacturers have you contacted? Five. Okay. How did you contact them? I've sent them an email. And and that was it. And they never responded. Seriously. So this is the, this is this is the point. Whereas for us, and I always say this for us. To get one price on average, it takes about three emails and four phone calls to one factory, right? And out of 60 manufacturers that we get in touch, this might get us 10 prices. Mm -hmm. Depends on the product. Textiles is easier, but if you're going for something specific, something that you're developing, this will be uh, more complicated. And if you have, again, if you have a few materials that you want to combine, it gets more and more complicated and factory might not even want to work with you uh, because it gets too complicated for them. And oh, what if they need to get extra machinery or, 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 you know, um, we wanted to, um, we had a customer for whom he had a product uh, made out of bamboo and bamboo doesn't grow in Europe, right? It grows in, it's as simple as that. it grows in Asia. So the idea was to get the bamboo from Asia and to manufacture the final product here in Europe. Mm -mm. They don't have the machinery. They don't have the knowledge, the experience, and they don't want to do this because they're afraid they're going to make a bad product. Let's put it this mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very uh Seems interesting, seems a lot of work for sellers as well. Um, anything else you could share with us that would kind of help to uh, uh, sellers look into this uh, near shoring and, and finding manufacturers uh, near uh, where they are based at? Uh, yeah, again, a goal, first of all, you need to understand, I would start, if you have a few SKUs that you're selling, I would start with your top seller for sure. Because uh, your top seller is something that you don't want to lose. And it's something that you want to, uh, you know, kind of insure or reinsure. So uh, I would start with this and I would look up whether the product itself, in which countries it can be produced, or the uh, material. One thing that people need to remember is always to look at the import tax. If you're selling in EU and you're manufacturing in EU, there will be no import tax. But if you're manufacturing in Europe, outside of EU, and you're selling in EU and you will be importing this, there will be the tax. So this is one of the things you also need to look at. And this is extremely important because we had some people who were like, oh, but this is Europe. Yeah, Europe is not EU. These are kind of two different things. Um, and, you know, some countries, they're within European Union, but they don't accept Schengen visa. And it, it, it's something that you need to know. So make sure to look at the HS code uh, for sure, because this might save you a lot of trouble because you might find the perfect manufacturer in the country near you, but the HS code might just simply uh, uh, eat you up. And um, also, uh, you need to understand that this, Setting up the manufacturing or finding manufacturers outside of China, it is a longer process. Um, it is more complicated. Um, and you just need to, it, it's painful. Sometimes it's extremely painful and you just need to get through it. Um, and if you do, you will have a first mover advantage. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much. It's so interesting to listen to, you, especially the examples. I think they help to illustrate the uh, the process and the overall um, space better than just knowing some theoretical parts because you are in it every day. Uh, you work with a lot of sellers and a lot of uh, factories as well. Um, so thank you very much for sharing everything. Uh, before we go, um, can you now give us an overview how Signify works together with sellers if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what kind of services you offer and uh, yeah, what's the best way to learn more about you? 
Uh, our website, Zignify.net, uh, we do product sourcing, we help with supply chain optimization, better pricing, better everything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and we kind of, uh, we almost hit, uh, we're almost at 60 women right now. Uh, two years, we're going to be two years uh, on the 31st of August, and we're almost 60 women and Sebastian. Yeah, I just wanted <laughs> to say don't leave Sebastian out because Sebastian is there as well, I know. But uh, that's yeah. super cool that your team only uh, mainly only mainly consists of women. So uh, that's very awesome. Uh, and we will definitely uh, put the link of the website in the description Thank as you. well. So um, if anybody wants to ask any questions or reach out to possibly work together, then uh, they can do it as well. And of course, if you like- They can the video, also drop a message on LinkedIn. So look, uh, I believe, I, I'm a true believer in kind of customer value overload, right? And given a lot of information to people, if, if it's easy for me and it takes only two minutes, I'll give it away for free. That's not a problem. So it's also my name here, written Yulia Blinova on LinkedIn. If you have a, just drop a voice message. If you have a short question, I'd be happy to help. No problem. If you want to pay for it, even better. But <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. And the third yeah. option is if you have questions that you think uh, might be interesting for others as well, you can leave them as comments as well. Uh, then we will ask you to come back to the video and answer those. And of course, if you like this video, then uh, uh, like. Uh, and if you are not subscribing our uh, channel yet then subscribe to orange click youtube channel too because uh, then you will see uh julia and signify in the future as well so yeah thanks again uh, it was great to see you and i hope to see you soon either uh through video recording or at some event i hope this video will uh, invite you to find the more sourcing destinations for your Amazon FBA business. And uh, if you have additional questions to Yulia, don't forget to use comment section below and we'll pass your questions to her. And if you enjoy videos we create with Amazon experts, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and of course, like this video as well. And now I would like to invite you to watch other video which will teach you how you could launch your Amazon products using Amazon PPC.